Her name was Mabel. This morning I thought, that's maybe the best opening line to a sermon I've ever been given. Her name was Mabel. And at the age of six, Mabel changed my life. At the age of five, I attended Woodlawn Elementary School as a kindergartner and was put into Mrs. Parkins' class. And I don't know what it was about kindergarten. I don't know what it was about school. I don't know what it was about Mrs. Parkins. But I didn't want to be there. And I was that kid that every morning... I would cry and say, Mommy, I'm not going to school. And Mommy would drag me screaming to school. And I remember one morning, it was one of the first days of of kindergarten. I'd been drugged to class. I was sitting there, and we had... Mrs. Parkins had had us all sitting on our little mats, and we were doing show and tell. And I just decided, nope, not doing it, not staying here. I stood up, and I ran out of the classroom, and I ran out the door, heard Mrs. Parkins screaming behind me. I ran down Madison, and there, right there at Lower Beaver, there's a stoplight. And I was running for all I was worth. I looked back. And Mrs. Parkins in her, I'll never forget this, I had this this deep in my memory, Mrs. Parkins in her 70s flower print dress and her white high heel sandals running down the street after me, but I got the walk light. (laughs) And I made it home. I walked in and my mom's like, what are you doing home? I said, mommy, I don't want you to be alone. And she drug me back to kindergarten. So now fast forward, I hate school. And on the first day of first grade, I walked in to Mabel Avery's class. And for years, I had no idea why. But the moment I stepped in that class and Mrs. Avery leaned over and said, hi, Tommy, it is so good to have you. I felt at home. And from that day forward, I loved school. It wasn't until 25 to 30 years later that I found out Mabel Avery is a priest of the living Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, open your word. Open the mysteries of the great story and help us to understand our place our role in your story at this moment in time and give us the grace and courage to step into that role and be obedient to who you have made us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2. All right, 1 Peter chapter 2. So get it open, and while we're opening our Bibles, let's watch this video together. Joey? During the first century, when the Romans ruled the known world, a grassroots countercultural movement was born in the eastern end of the empire. Yeah, it started among the Jewish people. Who for centuries now have been scattered around the known world. But no matter where they lived or what language they spoke, they kept their identity as the family of Abraham, devoted to the one true God. And every year, they would travel to Jerusalem for sacred festivals. And during one of these, 
the Feast of Pentecost. The visitors encountered a group of Jews who could somehow speak in everyone's native dialect. Yeah, they were telling stories about a man named Jesus who had been executed by the Romans. They claimed he had risen from the dead and was now exalted as the true king of Israel and the whole world. And this Jesus was now calling people to adopt his upside down set of values and live under his rule called the kingdom of God. And thousands of Jews decided to stay in Jerusalem and join the movement. It grew in size and in influence and gained favor with people. But not with the Jerusalem temple leaders. They viewed this whole thing as a dangerous religious sect, and they even executed one of its leaders named Stephen. It's no longer safe in Jerusalem, and so most of the followers flee for the outlying land called Judea. And you might think that's the end of the story, but actually this tragedy became the way the movement spread outside Jerusalem. That's where the second part of the book of Acts begins. The scattered followers end up in surprising places, like Samaria, where their ancient enemies live. Yeah, and Luke shows us how all of these unexpected people start following Jesus, like a sorcerer from Samaria who has to learn that the way of Jesus isn't about gaining power, but giving it up to serve others. There's also a story about an Ethiopian delegate who, after discussing the scroll of the prophet Isaiah with Philip, decides to join the movement. Yeah, Jesus is expanding his movement out into Judea and Samaria, just like he said he would. Which is great. But back in Jerusalem, we meet Saul of Tarsus. He's part of the religious elite who oppose the new movement, and he's finding and arresting Jesus' followers anywhere he can. This is a cruel guy. But think about it from his perspective. In the past, Israel had turned away to other gods and to false prophets, leading to disaster. He believed he was protecting Israel and God's honor by getting rid of these people. And then Saul hears that the movement spread north to Damascus. So he sets out there to find and arrest more followers. And on the way, Saul has this sudden encounter with the risen Jesus himself. Jesus asks Saul why he's fighting against him. And then Jesus commissioned Saul to now represent him to Israel and to the nations. And Saul is stunned and speechless. And so he ends up in Damascus, but now he's announcing the good news about the Jesus he had just been attacking. And no one saw this coming. Totally. And the same goes for what happened next. Over in the port city of Caesarea, there was a Roman centurion named Cornelius, and he represents everything the Jewish people would hate about the Roman occupation. An angel appears to him, and he tells him to call for a man named Peter. So Peter comes, and he finds Cornelius and his friends and his family all gathered together in his home. Yeah, and this is scandalous. Jewish people don't enter a non-Jewish home to avoid ritual impurity. So what's Peter going to do? Well, right before this, Peter had a vision. God brought to him a collection of animals that his people were forbidden to eat. And then God said to Peter, eat these. And this is shocking to Peter. He says, I've never eaten anything impure. And God responds, Don't call impure what I have made pure. And then that's it. The vision was over. So Peter's going to start a new diet? No, he's an Israelite. And he's honored these customary food laws his entire life. The vision was preparing him for this moment of him standing among impure non-Israelites. And he realizes that God is declaring these people are a part of the family of Abraham. And so Peter decides to stay and tell them about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit shows up just as he did at Pentecost, but now it's for a Roman centurion and his non-Jewish family. The movement is broken out. And so back in Jerusalem, Peter is now telling the other apostles about what happened, and they start getting reports about even more non-Jewish people following Jesus up in the big trade city north called Antioch. So they send a man there named Barnabas to check things out. Barnabas finds the Jesus movement alive and well in Antioch, and he finds it's made up of people from all over the world. And so Barnabas recruits Saul to come and work with him in Antioch for a year. They're teaching, living among the people there, watching the movement grow. The church in Antioch was the first international Jesus community, and it is where Jesus' followers were first called Christians, the Christ ones. And so the way of Jesus was transformed from a group of Messianic Jews in Jerusalem into the multi-ethnic Jesus movement spreading through the world. Their faith was the same. It was centered on the good news about the crucified Jesus who is the king of all nations. But that message and their new way of life was confusing, even threatening to the average Roman citizen living around them. And the resulting conflict is what we'll explore next as this movement goes global, or as Jesus said, to the ends of the earth. 
you wondering, for those of you who've been with us through the Acts series a couple years ago, why are we going back to Acts? Well, that's because if you haven't figured it out yet, there is a huge connection between how Kevin led us to the book of Acts for an entire year and what we studied in that year and what we are learning about exile. Did you catch how it was exile that led all of a sudden now with the followers of Jesus pushed out into the known world and under persecution were spread out? They were in exile. And it was those believers of Jesus, both Jewish in background and Gentile in background that Peter is writing to in 1 Peter. It's those exiles, okay? So there's a reason. Now, one thing, before we get started, we're gonna get into the scripture. I want us to understand that Jeremiah 29, where Kevin has been talking about the last few weeks how it was God saying, I have taken these people into exile. I have led my people into exile. God was doing it. He was carrying them there for a purpose. In the book of Acts, when the persecution came and the Christians went into exile around the Roman world, guess what? It was that exile that brought about the Jesus movement that literally turned the Roman world upside down. God was purposing both. So as we begin to experience the end of Christendom and the fact that Christians, as Kevin has been talking about, is going to the margins, I want us to understand. Keep reiterating it. The kingdom of God is not in trouble. And if he led the Hebrew people into Babylon and he led the Jesus movement throughout the Roman world and into Greece, then if he is leading us into exile, this is part of the story. And we can trust in the Lord with our whole heart and lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledge him. And our path will be straight. He'll make the way. Okay, you with me? All right. First Peter chapter two. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in salvation. So now, he's again, Peter is writing to believers in Jesus, both Jewish background, non-Jewish background. And as, as Phil shared with us last week, the push was to be holy. Well, why do we need to be holy? Why are we called to be set apart? We're going to find out today. And it begins in verse 4. As you come to him, you, Peter is writing to every believer, so you can embrace this you. He is writing to you as a believer in Jesus Christ. You, as you come to him, the living stone notice, capital S. What are we talking about? Why is it capitalized? He's using a metaphor here. A living stone rejected by men, chosen by God, and precious to him. So you, again, also embrace this, so I, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So every believer is going to be a brick, spiritually speaking, in the house of God. So when we talk about the fact that the church is not a building, it's an organism, that's because this is true. This is not the church, this, these walls that we're sitting in. We are the church. You notice he said a spiritual building, not a physical building, a spiritual building. And every person who believes in Christ is a brick in that building. Jesus is the cornerstone. And we are being built in the spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Okay, stop for a lot of us, especially those who've been raised in the Protestant tradition, don't really understand the idea of priesthood. Okay, we've talked about this before, but let me reiterate it for you. So priest really means a go-between, all right, a go-between. So if God is up here and we are down here, how am I going to get from down here up to God? Well, a priest is someone who stands in between and becomes the conduit, the vehicle by which a person connects with God. That's a priest, all right? Now, in, we'll talk about, 
the Hebrews here a little bit, but in the Roman Catholic tradition, they still have priests. And they believe that you can't get to Christ unless the priest, every week it gives you the Eucharist. He's the go-between, okay? And there are other, uh, other traditions that believe the same thing. So let's move on. You, you, every believer, notice, are being built to a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Wait, 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 I'm supposed to be a priest? That's what it says. God is building you to become a priest. All right, well, what does that mean? In order that you can order, uh, offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable God through Jesus Christ. Well, what sacrifices am I gonna to offer to God? What did Jesus say? If you wanna follow me, take up your, what? Cross and follow me. Jesus was the sacrifice on the cross, the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So what is he asking us to sacrifice? Ourselves. I sacrifice myself, and I sacrifice my desires, and I sacrifice my dreams, maybe, or I sacrifice what I want in order to be the person and to be the conduit for others to know Christ, whatever that might mean. It's going to be different for every person. But we are the sacrifice. We lay down our lives to follow Christ wherever he may lead us, to be the church and however he gifts us and leads us to serve him. So we now are the priests offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a precious cornerstone. So real quick, what is a cornerstone? A cornerstone is the first stone that is laid in the building. You put the cornerstone in place, it's the first one, and by where that cornerstone is laid, all the other stones, all the other bricks are laid in relationship to it. The cornerstone goes before, and then it determines where all the other the stones are laid. And it determines the location and direction of the building. So Christ is the cornerstone. He went first. He is in the middle. And all of us as stones are built into the family of God, the house of God, the spiritual church of God in relation to that one cornerstone. So we're stones too. We're part of this house. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, again, all of us, you who believe, everyone, we're not talking about certain people. We're talking about all believers. You who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, now he's quoting Psalm 118, 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And he's quoting Isaiah here, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. So some people, this stone becomes the cornerstone and becomes the foundation of our lives. For other people, this stone is rejected, okay? They stumble because when they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Verse nine, but you, well, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Now, those who were Jewish and had become Christians, this made total sense. Because when you say a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, they're like, going, yeah, we're God's chosen people. We believe that ever since Abraham and Moses. But then Paul goes on, or Peter goes on, once you were not a people. Oh, well, wait a minute. Who are we talking? Are we talking about the Jews now? No. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Joey, let's go to the first slide here. So, real quick, I want to share with you. Oh, it's kind of hard to see. I want to share with you um, a principle and a teaching of the great story in the Bible that most people don't get. 
And I believe that the, the institutional church has not really embraced or believed for 1,700 years. So here it is. So this paradigm, this is the pre-Jesus paradigm. So here we've got all, let's look at that, all the people in the world, right? And then right there in the section, this was the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. And then notice that we've got the circle of love. We've got Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're doing the divine dance, the perichoresis. And in the Jewish Hebrew paradigm, we had a priest. So the priest is the guy in white because he's standing between the people and God. And notice the little, the little arrows there because the sacrifice, the blood was spilled. The priest made the sacrifice and became the conduit for the people to be forgiven by God and be ritually pure. But then there was this other person that was the king. And so you had royalty on one hand and you had the priesthood on the other hand, two distinct people. The priest had to come from the family of Aaron. The king had to come from the family of David. And the people couldn't get to God without this conduit, this go-between. So when Peter says, you are a chosen people, a priesthood, a holy nation, this is what the Jewish people who are now believers, understood. This is what they've been raised with. But now there's going to be a shift. Let's go to the next slide. Notice that God said to Abraham at the very beginning, Abraham is the, the tribal cornerstone. He was the first patriarch way back in Genesis. God said to Abraham, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring, Abraham, all nations, all nations, not just Israel, all nations. And in fact, if you go to Genesis 12, he said to Abraham, all peoples, are going to be blessed on this earth. So it's not just about God's Hebrew people. He said it from the beginning. It's about all peoples, okay? Then he said to the prophet Joel, I will pour out my spirit on all people, all right? Your sons and daughters. So now, now it's not just the male priest. I'm gonna pour out my spirit on both men and women. And notice he says, not just men and women, he says sons and daughters. So now we're taking age out of it, all right? So Sons, daughters, young people, male, female will prophesy. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that prophecy is the greatest of the spiritual gifts. So what Joel is saying here is even young people, sons and daughters, even men, women, there's going to be no distinction. We'll all experience the greatest of the gifts. Now, we all have different gifts. We're not all prophets. We're not all teachers. We're not all preachers. We're not all, we all have different gifts. But what Joel is saying here is there's going to come a day when these distinctions fall away and all people will experience the spirit of God and all people will experience the gifts of God and God will use all people, young, old, female, male, Jewish, Gentile, and then Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So now we've got Jesus, who was from the line of David, so he's from the royal line. We have Jesus, who became the high priest, not in the family of Aaron, but before Aaron, go all the way back to Genesis, there was another high priest, even before Moses named Melchizedek. Go to Hebrews chapter seven if you want to study more about Melchizedek. But Jesus was a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, this mysterious priesthood of God. So Jesus becomes both king and priest. He became the atoning sacrifice. So what does this mean? Let's go to the next slide. I want you to see this. Paul, a Jewish teacher, James, the Jewish leader in Jerusalem. Peter, the Jewish follower of Jesus. They were making this shift to understand that God's chosen people was no longer about being a Jewish, by blood, by genetics person. 
Paul said, a person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. A person is a Jew who is one inwardly. When your heart becomes circumcised by Christ, when Christ comes in and changes your heart and takes up residence within you, you are a chosen person of God. So Paul was saying this. James said, James, the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Well, who, 12 tribes, not the 12 tribes of Israel. He's writing to believers. What James is saying there is that now that Christ has come, those who are really God's chosen people, those who represent the 12 tribes are all those who believe in Christ. The shift from the Hebrew paradigm to the new paradigm of God. And Peter says it today. The, cho the chosen people, you who believe in Christ. You are a royal priesthood. What does he mean? Remember Christ with the, with the throne? Christ is both king and priest. We who believe have been adopted into the family of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. What that means is we are prince and princesses of God's kingdom. We are part of the royal line and we are a royal priesthood. So let's go to the next slide. So now what they're saying in 1 Peter is, this is what it looks like now. The chosen people, that's the black line. The royal priesthood, the purple line is for royalty. The red line is for the sacrifice and the priesthood. Now through Christ, Christ has gone out and now God's people are all over. They're mixed in. It's not just this one little column the chosen people of God are everywhere, of all people, all nations, everywhere, anyone who comes to him. Next slide, please. So this is us. The Holy Spirit was poured out. Christ comes into our heart. Wendy just shared with me this morning that she was listening to a podcast, and it said, it said intimacy is into me, you see, when Christ comes in, like, like Phil talked about last week, he wants to come in, he wants to be with us. And when that happens, we are now the children of God. King Jesus is in our hearts. We're in part of the circle dance. And we now are the conduit. We are the priests. God wants to use us to connect people who don't know him to him. Let's go to the next slide, please. So this is what it really is. This is the paradigm now. All of us spread out all over the place, being little conduits for Christ. It's, we are the priests. We connect people to God. Oh, what do you mean? Oh, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know enough of my Bible. You know what? Jesus never said, go to all nations and teach them the Torah. Jesus said, when you go, they're going to know that you are Christians by your love. Being a priest of the most high God is about loving people, being patient and kind and gentle, having self-control. So that people see, that's why Phil was into the holiness last week, and Kevin talked about holiness last week. It's cause so that people, when they see us, they go, there's something different about you. I don't know what it is. There's something I, but I want to know more what it is. That's being a priest. You're saying, hey, I got something. And I can show you the way. So that's us. Now, in 300, just after 300 AD, something happened. Constantine, the emperor of Rome, became a believer. And he decided that what was going to happen is uh, that all of Rome was now going to be Christian. And Christianity would become the state religion of Rome. And overnight, this Jesus movement that looked like this became an empire. And all of a sudden, the Jesus movement politically, monetarily, socially ran the Roman Empire. 
So you know what happens when you have worldly power? You control people. So let's go to the next slide, please. Ever since then, this has been the Christendom paradigm. Now, we have different shades because we have different shades of Christianity. We had Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox. We had Protestants. We have Baptists and Methodists. But we all have our own column. We're God's people. But now notice what Christendom did. Now between King Jesus and the circle of love and all of the people who are believers, there is this special class. The Catholics and the Orthodox say those are the priests and only men can be priests. And you can't get to Christ without the priest being the way for you. And they're kind of a special class of people inside the church. Well, Protestants, they said, oh, we don't need a priest. But guess what? We still do it, don't we? I mean, I've been doing this thing 40 years, right? We look at Kevin and we kind of go, oh, well, he's special. He's, he's on like a spiritual class between us and, and God. We do that with pastors all the time. So the thing about Christendom is we've been all about social control. That's what we want to do. We want to control people's behaviors. We want to control how people think, what they do, how they behave. And for the church, for a long time, it's like, no, 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 no. Only a certain class of people can actually do the work of God. So all of you out here, you're just, I don't know what you are. You're just minions. Just minions, right? Just come, pretend that you're listening for an hour a week, throw a few bucks in the plate, and let the professional ministry people take care of the rest. And for 1,700 years, we were all like, Okay, all right, cool. Because it's really easy to do that. But when you tell me, I gotta be a priest. Now we're getting serious. When you tell me that it's my job to sacrifice myself for others, I'm not sure I wanna do that. So why is this important? Here's what I believe. We are and will be increasingly experiencing that the church of Jesus Christ, the Jesus movement in the 21st century is going to be exiled. Churches are closing. Denominations are imploding. The younger generation, Jesus said, you know, how can you, you can tell the weather, but you can't see the signs of the times. Well, I try and look at the signs of the times, and here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a generation of young people that want nothing to do with the institutional church. I see I, young people I know, but what I see them doing is I see them going to church on podcasts and living out life with people who think and believe like them and doing life together. And I believe, just like Kevin does, I believe personally that God is leading us back to acts. where the Christendom paradigm is going to fall apart because nobody wants to be part of this institution that ruled for 1,700 years and didn't really make anything better. People are looking for something that actually makes a difference in my life. And I'm the priest who's supposed to show them. I'll ask the... Uh, Team to come on up, get ready. 25, 30 years after my first grade, I'd often told people that, that Mrs. Avery in first grade changed my life. She made me love school, big influence on my life. My mom called me one day and said, 
do you remember a woman named Mabel Avery? I'm like, Mrs. Avery, of course. She said, um, well, I was ushering at church, uh, and this woman came up and said, I'm Mabel Avery. Are you Tommy Vanderwell's mom? She said, well, I am. She said, oh, I remember Tommy. Be sure and tell him hi for me. So my mom called me, and I'm like going, Oh my gosh, because you know when you're like six? I thought she was like on death's door, you know? She was probably like my age, but she's like, you know, I thought, oh, well, she's got to be dead years ago. No, nope, no, nope, she's still around, alive and kicking. So I looked her up and I called her and I said, can I come over? I'd just like to come over and visit with you. And I wanted to go over and thank her for the influence she had in my life. So we went over to her house and, you know, we sat down and we started talking and she said, oh, and she pulled out this, this album. It was like thick. And she boom. boom. <laughs> and it was the class picture of every class that she had taught. And she pulls out my class there and she says, okay. And she starts going through and she starts telling me the names of every student in the class and starts telling me about each one. And she's like, oh yeah, he had a really rough life. And, it's been, and then she's like, oh, I prayed for every one of you every day. She was a priest. And I walked in, this little six-year-old boy walks in here, hating school, I'm scared and I'm afraid. And I walk into the presence of the priest of the living Christ who says, I'm gonna pray for you and love you. And I'll teach you some math too. And I didn't even know it. But she connected me to the living Christ. Even before I even <laughs> make my own decision, years, years later, seven years later. But she connected me. She was my priest. So here's the thing. This week, I have been doing a, just end of this week, COVID, can't be with clients. So I've got three people that I have done one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, mentoring with clients that I work with in my uh, vocation for my company. And this week, I've, and the, the last week, over the last two weeks, I've had three people break down crying in our coaching sessions. One, one of my clients kind of goes, okay, this is getting a lot more personal than I expected it to get. I'm like, it's okay. I had another client who called me, he, he arranged this coaching session. Here's the thing, his, his boss, his employer, Hasn't been paying me to do coaching with him, but he keeps calling me and he keeps getting on my calendar. So I'm not getting paid to coach him, but he keeps coming to me. And I'm like, oh, no, okay. And I'm going to keep coaching him. You know why? Because I love him. He's an amazing young man. There's a bright future ahead of him. And he, he comes to the coaching session and I said, so what's going on with you? And the first thing he shares with me is, well, the first thing I think you should know is that I've got this couple and they're going through a divorce and he's living with me and she's still at home with their three-year-old, but um, I am the only friend they have in the world and I'm the only one that they trust and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, this has nothing to do with work. I'm being a priest. I hope that when we talk over Zoom and Microsoft Teams that those people just kind of go, hey, Tom, I don't know why, but I just feel comfortable talking to you about stuff that I don't talk to anybody else about. And I hope that that's Jesus in me that they sense. I am a priest in my work. You are a priest at your work. You are a priest at your school. Remember, that doesn't matter our age or gender or education level. You are a royal priest if you believe in Christ, if he is in you. So wherever you go this week, even as a student in a class, you can be a priest for that teacher and have an impact on their lives. In your work, in your homes, in your neighborhoods. That's where we're being led. Out of Christendom. Back to Acts. Let's pray. 
Jesus, help us to believe it. And give us, Lord, hearts that are open to seeking out how you want to love through us. In your name, amen.